Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, but it's good morning, I guess, there in Cairo. And um, so my name is Christian Ost, and as maybe uh, has been presented uh, uh, before, I would like to give you an insight in terms of economics of conservation, which is these, these days a mainstream, of course, option. Uh, that was not exactly the same 20 years ago or 30 years ago when I, I started dealing with economics of conservation. But these days we realize how important it is to couple this question about economic outcomes, economic values, and also cultural values. So this is, of course, the common thread of this presentation. I will take a lot of example, best practice, and also example in in, in, in that fantastic city of historic Cairo. And, uh, and so we will go through the different, uh, different items about, about that. I will share my, 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 my screen. Um, so let me go like to just take the, the screen here. So what I would like to uh, to tell you is, is about um, a discussion about heritage economics that will also revisit the paradigm of urban conservation. So we will be able maybe uh, through this uh, discussion and also during the question and the, the, the question time uh, after that, maybe to have a reflection, not just on heritage economics, but oh, by coupling heritage economics with urban conservation these days, we can have maybe another perspective on the paradigm of conservation uh, itself. Uh, so I would like to start with just a quote about Robert Solow. Robert Solow is a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and he used to say that nothing is more important as the identity and livability of a place in bringing economic success. So basically, what we get in this quote is a sort of equation set by Robert Solow, uh, looking at the identity of things and of places, of course, the livability of it, and then it provides some economic success. So I would suggest to take this quote as a content and a common thread of the presentation. So to start with, how we see cultural identity. Number two, how we can, um, how we can cope uh, in economic terms with urban livability. And then of course, uh, to go to the economic success or to the economic outcomes in terms of measurements and some recommendations about, about that. Uh, so the let's start with this cultural identity, as we can define it as the person's self-perception of belong belonging to a group uh, in a place. Um, I think this is, of course, one of the main issues that we deal with cities, with places, and also with uh, conservation, because identity uh, embed a lot of different tangible and intangible things. Um, just to give a quick um, um, uh, comment on the fact that cultural identity and bad tangible heritage, uh, we have, of course, the UNESCO World Heritage Site and everything which is about the UNESCO list, which is clearly related to some outstanding not just tangible heritage, but tangible heritage with outstanding universal value, as you may know. Um, it's important also to see that in the, ca the case of Cairo, we get this um, uh, really with outstanding value, but a substantial intangible heritage. This is just an example, uh, looking at the webpage of UNESCO again. Um, but what I would like also to add to that is that when we take this cultural identity is not just related to cultural heritage. Uh, in fact, we have a lot of um, uh, 
uh, a lot of initiatives these days uh, where the we found that we have a, an extended, I would say, concept of cultural uh, of cultural activities and of cultural uh, values. Uh, and one of the example is this African capitals of culture. We get that also in other part of the world, like the European capital of culture, which basically aims to connect you see the community and with the artist, but also to bring there at the same time, uh, I would say past heritage, these monuments and tangible heritage, but also some more contemporary or uh, new uh, artifacts and uh, new uh, contemporary form of arts and so on, which is uh, clearly included in a large definition of cultural identity, this is to me very important from an economic point of view because of all the, 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 uh, the implication, I would say, in terms of outcomes, in terms of production and in terms of consumption of cultural goods and cultural services. So, of course, the film industry, entertainment, sport, video game, which are such important these days is really a part of this identity. Part of the identity is also the creative industries. And I would like also to really underline that because these days, uh, as you know, the uh, what we call the CCI, cultural and creative industries, has really, are really mainstream uh, these days. Um, you may know, you probably know that, of course, UNESCO has this list of creative cities and uh, the network of creative cities, and that Cairo is, of course, part of this network uh, for all the crafts and folk arts developed in the, in the city. So, again, let me underline the fact that creativity here, which comes from the artistic world by definition, is also something that goes, you know, um, among all different industrial sectors. Creativity these days uh, embedded a lot of industries where basically you have creativity as a source of innovation including a source of you know, technological innovation is based on this creative process. So to me, identity and cultural identity in the city is also related to this important topic of creativity. Um, speaking about creativity, uh, there's no uh, surprise how important is creativity, the creativity that the United Nations decided that 2021 is actually the international year of creative economy for sustainable development. We will come back later during this presentation about sustainable development, but of course this is a way here to see how creativity is important as an artistic or a cultural concept, but also related to economic uh, output in economic uh, in industries. And creativity, of course, here again, um, entails a lot of different skills, knowledge, and innovation uh, processes. So, in a nutshell, uh, and in economic terms, I would say and I would suggest to take uh, this concept of cultural capital that a colleague of mine, David Trosby, uh, has defined uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, we could say that Cairo possesses an outstanding urban cultural capital, which is another form of capital, like financial capital, human capital, social capital. Sometimes we speak about urban capital, but here we have this concept of urban cultural capital, which really emphasizes all, not just the tangible and intangible heritage, but this cultural identity that we try to, to look at uh, um, in, a, in a city or in a, in a neighborhood uh, in, in the historic uh, Cairo. So like any form of capital, as you may know, <clears throat> this 
cultural capital will gives rise to a huge flow of goods and services over time, not just cultural services, not just cultural goods like arts, uh, art, uh, craftsman, uh, craftsman uh, ship output and so on, but also more usual or common uh, e economic goods, other economic goods. Uh, it gives rise to this flow of goods and services. And of course, at the other side, it requires to be, of course, maintained. Uh, it requires investment of physical and human resources to be maintained and to be kept in condition, I would say, to give rise to this flow of goods and services. This is why it's a capital. This is why it's a capital to be preserved, to be protected. And this is why conservation can be seen in economic terms as an investment process. You bring new resources, new skills in preserving and maintaining the capital. This is very helpful, I would say, to have this economic definitions of urban ca cultural capital to define some places and some urban areas. Again, to this cultural uh, identity, I would like to have a comment about having read all the document that has been uh, provided in the in the in the last in the recent years and uh, and in the last decade that there has a much been done there and a much been done to document basically this urban cultural capital. So it's not just a concept, it's something that is already well documented for most of uh, the territory of Cairo. And we can rely to most of these uh, readings and uh, very interesting and useful studies about tangible heritage, intangible uh, intangible heritage, but also about everything that is related basically to this notion of cultural identity. Even although it is not uh, merely um, uh, called about cultural capital, the, the word cannot be used, but it's still there. And this is important that there is this huge economic resources and huge capital that is documented in these uh, brochure and folders. Let's go now to the second chapter of this presentation about the other words that we need to provide economic success. This is livability. Livability of a place can also bring uh, economic success when it is merged with identity. Let's take a look to livability through a very good example that, of course, I took in, in Cairo uh, and this uh, uh, amazing uh, project made by the Aga Khan Trust uh, about the park, but also the renovation around uh, this park. And this is provide a good example, basically, of what we expect about livability, a place or communities being safe, attractive, socially cohesive, inclusive, environmentally sustainable. Again, you see that sustainability, he is at the core with what we see. With affordable and diverse housing, which is a very important question about the city of Cairo, linked by convenient public transport, walking, cycling infrastructure, employment, education, public office, or local shops, health, uh, etc. You see, everything is part. It's a multifactorial fact that we have livability. It's not just about a, a question of health, safety, or personal comfort is something that really is collective, I would say macro, social, or macroeconomic, and that we try uh, to, 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 to address that way. You will find, and we can find many, many studies about this quality of life, which is an indicator of life of livability and the different score or the different factors 
that may explain when if you get uh, a very attractive city if you get the quality of life uh, city if you get a, li a, a, a livable city and so on starting with housing but getting in the different fields you see that uh, the perception of by a community of the place they live in. So livability, of course, is important. Again, going into all the readings and all the the the, um, uh, the studies uh, being made uh, about Cairo, we can find this livability almost everywhere. These are two examples that I took. Uh, just to uh, to reflect uh, for a, a, a few minutes about one of the factor of livability in urban spaces, which is the mobility, which is the walkability, and which is of course a challenge and a concern uh, in the case of Cairo. As you see, we have two examples coming from two different studies about, for example, vacant lands used temporarily as parking, which is uh, something and the other thing is about walkability about measuring you see how walkability is easy or difficult for pedestrian for residents including for tourists or visitors about about the city so this uh, really this question of livability just to take that as a as as an example is addressed in this different documentation and i would say that it could also be related to uh, economic or to um, or to other uh, i would say outcome not just cultural one because here you get two examples of that but we may find many other examples of that to relate walkability as a factor of livability to, for example, real estate, the real estate market. Uh, this is a study that identified the fact that the more walkable are the city, I would say we could see the more livable are the city. Uh, well, the higher uh, the the added value, I would say, about the real estate market is 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 gaining, and so how economic prosperity can be improved, not just by um, the uh, improvement of the urban fabric, but by the improvement of the of the area and about, about the, the, the place around the building, which is important to have this comprehensive perspective uh, or holistic vision about the city. The other example is far more important because it's really to health issues, to health issues. These are one of the studies uh, demonstrating that the better walkability you get and the, the, that improves uh, the implication is an improvement in the health issues. So livability uh, basically is something that is clearly related to many sectors of the social life or the economic life. And at the end, it can be translated in some economic saving, in some um, public finance implications, you know, by uh, saving some social cost because the regenerating of the city is conducted in a very sound way. So impact are not just cultural. This is what I would like here to, to show. It goes beyond the cultural values. Again, another example that I found very interesting going in the study is the community-oriented activity patterns study uh, made here in Cora with many examples in Cairo about the different places. Um, the, this aims to, uh, to justify and to convince uh, decision makers that it's important to preser preserve not just the urban fabric, but also all the existing activity patterns and the consumers uh, behavior because this is related not 
sometimes to intangible heritage, traditions, you know, knowledge, uh, behavior, but also it's part of the city as a whole. So again, about this holistic perspective, uh, there's no reason to protect the building if nobody lives there, nobody works there, or if there is no passers by in the streets. So this is part really again of this vision of uh, livability of a place. I've taken an example by um, a thematic markets, looking at the places where food in the street uh, is, is sold, uh, sometimes in an informal way, but how important this is for the, the livability of the, of the city. And I take another example just to convince you that this is not a, just an exception. Uh, this is a city uh, a studies uh, that were conducted in Penang uh, in Malaysia. And this the aim was exactly the same. This is called cultural mapping because we try to understand a place, a community there, and the possibility, you know, to preserve some uh, some consumer behavior, some activity patterns, some commercial activities, street vendors, and a lot of things that can be related to, not just to livability of the city uh, for residents, for visitors going there, but also to intangible heritage. Because if you see in the list that you get here on the, on the screen, uh, there is a mention about hungry ghost festival sites and ritual, which is an important intangible heritage in Penang. So Penang being an historic uh, world heritage, historic UNESCO uh, city, has at the same time this connection with intangible heritage, the urban fabric, of course, the tangible heritage, but also the all the behavior of so it's a human-centered vision where everything is connected and provided this um, cultural identity plus urban livability. This is, to me, what the quote of Robert Solo is, 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 is looking at. And I like also the, the quotation here, vendors and other informal workers make cities vibrant. C cities will be like dead cities without this work, which is really true from a socio-economic uh, perspective. I would like to, to show you another example, which was conducted by, uh, by myself and a team in uh, the framework of a Horizon 2020 European project for the city of Salerno in Southern Italy, where you get the mapping of this livability, I would say, uh, uh, items or assets, you well, where we you try to connect basically on the top of the um, of, of, of the screen, the different hotels, restaurants, accommodations, bars, all these places, you know, that make the city is livable and at the bottom or the background of the of the map are, is exactly the same places along the beach that if, if you see at the bottom and where you get all this tangible heritage all the uh, some churches some build, public building town halls and also the dotted area uh expressing all the intangible heritage because these are the places where you get some markets where you get some processions where you you get some festivals and so there is an overlap basically of the, the these different layers of cultural values of economic values and on of social values this is really what it's at stake here as you may know UNESCO uh, made a recommendation a few years ago in 2011, 10 years ago, almost times is passing very fast about historic urban landscape. And historic urban landscape is to me precisely the good concept or the good methodology or the tool, uh, the toolbox that could be really helpful in addressing this question of 
complexity where you get you see not just the urban fabric but you are in a human centered uh, city with a lot of cultural mapping a lot of identity and everything transportation land uses and the regulations that could be brought together this is the article 8 of the recommendation on historic urban landscape where we speak really about a holistic vision uh, that embedded not just cultural and natural values but also of course human values in a broader urban context uh, and a broader uh, system i would say it's a systemic vision a systemic perspective of a complex uh, situation now we come to the last part and to the chapter three about the economic success so we saw how to deal and document identity livability now how can we uh, uh, how can we uh, bring i would say the implication of that in terms of economic growth in terms of economic welfare in terms of economic success so that means to be maybe uh, defined and this is where i come back to the title of my presentation uh, when i said that uh, we will go towards a new paradigm in urban conservation it's not truly uh, very it's not in opposition of what we do today, of course, but it's that uh, we highlight maybe some part of this paradigm differently from the past. We used to have urban conservation as facing, you know, uh, the preservation of urban fabric and dealing with cultural intrinsic values being, of course, documented that very well in this urban fabric, like in the historic Carroll. And most of the time, I realized that as a cultural economics economist, I uh, saw so the economic outcomes in this paradigm as a welcome, <laughs> maybe outcome of it as a sort of bonus, but not really integrated with the urban conservation process or the cultural values. That was the creation of jobs from conservation. That was uh, the outcomes from tourism, from visitors, which is good, which is, of course, uh, very welcome, but maybe not uh, really, you see, connected the way it should be uh, when we, lo we looked at this quote about uh, identity, cultural identity on one side and livability, which is mostly social and economic uh, aspect of the city. So what I would like here to suggest is just to rely on the sustainable development goals and the sustainable agenda, which is mainstream uh, these days, as you know, and which is developed either by UNESCO in the Quito report on 2016 culture urban future or in the very well known these day global the 17 global goals, where, as you know, goal 11 uh, uh, aims to uh, the livability, pre precisely livable, livable cities, and in particular, speak about the cultural heritage inside these, within these cities. So the paradigm here, uh, uh, the paradigm is, is the following, urban conservation, of course, uh, achieve cultural values and cultural goals, uh, but these cultural values maybe an instrumental maybe an intermediary thing for other goals which are overarching i would say the sustainable development goals that we could bring into a simple paradigm of four pillars of uh, uh, of uh, uh, main uh, main outcomes being the cultural pillar economic social and environmental uh, this is the overarching perspective, the overarching, uh, I would say, uh, vision or strategy that we deal with urban conservation. And 
the reason for that is to better connect it. You see the different policies, being cultural policies, not separate from a social policies, from an economic policies or from an environmental policies. These are, I would say, the different dimensions of the same of the same city. If I take into consideration this, I would say this sustainable paradigm, and here you find an example which is very well uh, described uh, in the conclusion and recommendation of the uh, of the final report of the urban Re regeneration project for historic Cairo. You can read on page 137, enable adaptive reuse for non-residential activities, thereby promoting economic and cultural revitalization as a component of the sustainable conservation process. Nothing can be said clearer than that. And I think this is really also consistent with the quote by Robert Solo. It is about cultural uh, identity because adaptive reuse can be here for, of course, an urban fabric and for cultural building with cultural values. And then you get this connection that is made, you see, and the context of sustainable conservation that opens really uh, the perspective that what, what we do around here. So to take another example from uh, the very, very interesting uh, studies about sustainability at commercial and productive of commercial and productive activities uh, done living in, in and working in historic Cairo, you may find this quotation that exactly uh, uh, identifies this, this question. As you see, this dynamic of local development is much alive and needs to be sustained, but the available perceived opportunity should be modified to redirect the morphology of the end product not for the heritage value of the physical environment alone, but because my German plan is aimed towards something else, protecting and improving living conditions, not necessarily to attract tourists. This is of very greater importance because this means that you see the goal is not just a linear goal of cultural values protecting with the possible outcome or the welcome of tourism uh, after that, and the risk in a COVID time that these outcomes disappear. It's more. It's really more about that. It's more connecting everything in the process of conservation and providing also uh, um, the heritage and urban conservation to fulfill uh, some needs and uh, to bring. Uh, more livability in a place for residents as well as visitors and tourists. And this is, of course, to take into consideration um, this paradigm about the four pillar that was very well explicit in the publication of Heritage Counts for Europe by the European Commission a few years ago, where they identified the different places or the different indicators where these different pillars interconnect. And that's of course shows the, that it's a challenge to get sustainable development because it's not just uh, conserving the cultural heritage, uh, developing social policies, economic policies, environmental policies, but to bring these together. So that means that to, to, to protect a building, to adapt it to a reuse, which is at the same time uh, fitting social needs, economic needs in terms of real estate market, in terms of return on investment, and also in an environmental, you see, framework. Meaning that the decision should be long-term decision, of course, by definition, because we speak about environmental impact also. Uh, climate change and all the question of po uh, pollution, environmental risk that, that you know. So these go together. And bringing this, some of the indicators together is a way, of course, to achieve this sustainability and sustainable development. Again, everything I think is 
among all the projects and all the studies that has been done on historic Cairo. It's just a way to, you see, reconnect some network, some systemic and some really, I would say, privileged network there uh, to link important indicators. Really quickly, because I come to the end of the presentation, some example, what is sustainability, what is not sustainability in a city. Look at this island experience in New York. This is a social, uh, was a social project by local people with the local means, no public subsidy. And it's also a cultural heritage because this is the line, of course, of the, the, the metro, of the subway. And this is an environmental project. And at the same time, it's uh, an economic project because it, it, it brings a return on the investment. So this is how you connect all the things. Look at the, the, the best practice of the, of the city of, of, of Bilbao in Spain. We may discuss about when I say best practice, but from the point of sustainability, uh, you don't get just the museum. The museum is an iconic thing, but Armand, in the surrounding on that. And there was a, a huge regenerating program that includes social housing, mobility, transportation, uh, attractiveness, of course, accommodation for tourism. So this is what I would like to stress, even if the practices are not the perfect one, it, it, it is complex situation that we're dealt with complex uh, and, uh, and um, multifactorial uh, tools, I would say. Good example to me about also uh, the Akakan Trust Initiative because you, you get also these different dimensions, the four pillars are, are, are there. On the opposite, we can find something which is unsustainable because the economic uh, pillar is dominant and too much. And um, aiming just to increase the number of tourists is of course, uh, is made to the cost of the environmental pillar, to the social pillar, because you get people leaving the city, gentrification or, no more plumber uh, bakery to be found uh, in, in, in the city. So this is of course a, a very clear example, I would say where you can see that the different indicators and the different pillars is not really in line. So how to make sustainable urban conservation this economic success? We may rely of course on some economic analysis that you may know. Uh, this is just an example made by David Trosby for the World Bank, uh, an investment in urban heritage. And to, to look at the different indicators, I'm not going to, uh, to spend too much time on what has been done already. Uh, um, looking at the different economic values that we can have found from rehabilitation or regenerating, basically, and this is a, a really summary of the economic literature on the subject, you get these use values being the use of the building, of course, and the urban fabric, you get all the non-use values that you get outside of the market, but all these willingness uh, for different uh, actors and different stakeholders you see to intervene and you get all the externalities, all the impact on the city as a whole. Being positive or negative, you get this macro thing working uh, to at the scale of a city like, like Cairo. But you have something else and this is what I would like to finish with. There is this concept of circular economy, which is really appropriate uh, to deal with complex situation like regenerating uh, cities and historic cities. Circular models, you know what it is all about because it's about having this circular thing of designing, produ producing, distributing, 
consuming the thing and then recycling everything. So that means that there's no waste. And these are the closed loops with some local implication of production and consumption, not bringing some, you see some uh, craftsmanship from uh, a, a country uh, long away from home, but producing locally, consuming locally and making all these links together. Um, I would like to recommend you if you have time to go to on the click project, European project that I mentioned before, which was a European 2020 project, uh, which, which were, were dedicated to our secular models could leverage investment in cultural heritage adaptive reuse. And we, when we try to, to, to bring some recommendations in terms of how you can see a city as a, or a neighborhood as a circular economy, as a place with circular things, with closed loops, and how uh, the heritage and the cultural identity is such important there. Why is it important? Because we can apply the principle of circular economy to urban conservation. It's about reusing, it's about reducing waste, it's about repairing, it's about remanufacturing some products. When you think about craftsmanship in, in, in Cairo, it's about recycling things, recovering things. So this is one of the definition of the circular economy through the nine R's that we can apply clearly to this regenerating program. By the, by the way, regenerating starts with a R2, so we get maybe here nine R's for one major R that we get. Of. And this is, again, what I found in this interesting study about living and working. When you see on the left, on the right hand side, you see exactly that this was a vision of all the different shops were related, were connected. We didn't need to get material from, you know, outside of the city or that proximity provide these closed loops, you see, about uh, these different activities. And this is really a chance, an opportunity. And it's important, of course, that urban conservation should not disrupt these closed loops that are so efficient in terms of economics. So the processes of circular economy basically can play their role at micro level over a single building, you know, single project, a single work by reusing, recycling materials. It, it is also valid at meso level to the, uh, the level of a area, a neighborhood, a quarter with the proximity of the services of the shops with the transportation, which can make accessible everything. It's also true at macro level, a circular economy, because at the level of the city itself or the country, you get the same kind of discussion about how can I remain, you see, consistent with uh, with this different uh, cycle of material, of consumption, of production, and so on. And it's true that it's also really circular, I would say, in terms of the values. Because what is conservation? It's to transmit values to the next generation. So you see that the circularity is here inside of cultural heritage, which is really amazing. It's not just a, a commercial process production, consumption, supply or demand. Values are really in a circular way going from one generation to the other. And we get this common sharing these different values. And this can be done uh, by innovative tools. This is what in the CLIC project we, we try to develop. One of the innovating tools is about governance models. We need to change the governance models. We need to have a participatory planning, stakeholders consultations, and making some stakeholder mapping the way that you have an example there, where the different stakeholders in the city 
have different powers and different interests and to see and to look how to communicate with them or to bring them around on their own table and how to address the different issues because the stakes are so different sometimes conflicting so it's important that visitors and tourists are there but it's important at the same time that the residents could have this this is how sustainability works because you get different pillars about that uh, you may also be innovative, and this is a very important deliverable of the CLIC project about new financial models, which are circular also in terms of revolving funds, in terms of funding that could be reused. And basically what we have on this screen is to say we get these three sources of funding, either the government or the market, the private sector, or the third informal sphere, you know, through donation, volunteering, uh, association, and so on. We get these three systems, but these three systems can be bring together and can be uh, afford to be a circular one where the, the government gets tax revenues and get tax uh, 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 tax uh, that paid back, you know, the subsidy that. Uh, so this is oh, these things can be circular. The same about the market uh, sphere and the same about the third informal sphere. I have just an example here to see that public intervention of the market through the different ways that we know already, economic incentives, subsidy, taxes, exemption, regulation, and so on, can be connected to private funding to the market sphere, because the urban investment needs at the same time private funding and public funding. And the way that we do this to make them sustainable is different. Uh, innovative tools, land value finance, perpetual rents, uh, tax exemption. I, of course, I'm not, I don't have the time to do that, but this is how to make sustainability circular and economic success I make sure that this happened. Crowdfunding, as you know, is also not uh, something very popular. That. Very last slide. So as a conclusion here, or to make sustainable urban conservation economic success, Identity plus livability bring economic success by undertaking a full assessment of the urban cultural capital, not just cultural heritage, but all the creative and cultural industries and everything. Number two, urban livability. Again, urban livability is see is an holistic way, is how the city can provide different urban services and so on. Number three, the sustainable development goals is really the vision, you see, is the long-term vision, not just the protection of a building in the in, 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 in a short-term vision. Number four, innovative governance processes, like I mentioned, number five, public-private partnerships that I haven't mentioned uh, that much, but which is important, and number six, uh, about these innovative financial uh, uh, vehicles, new vehicle. This wants to provide the economic success that I mentioned and to bring Cairo, you see, from the emerging maybe to the major, major uh, cities uh, with a lot of uh, growth potential. Thank you very much for your attention.